Hi, are we good? We are good. I see the record <laughs> button. <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. Good morning, Celeste. I am good so, morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you. And man, we have spoken early on the phone how I'm such a big fan of you. And <laughs> Thank you. So good to see you face to face. And it's an honor to be able to share this space with you. I totally admire your work and what you're doing. So, Thank you. Yeah. I, so every, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I'm going to introduce you to our audience because you are quite an amazing gal, and I think you, the people deserve to know all that you do. So this is Celeste Rains Turk. Today, I'm speaking with the author, podcast host, bikini competitor. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> And mindset mentor, her name is Celeste Rains Turk, who specializes in helping people make peace with food, their body, their goals, using psychology, personal development, mindfulness, and her signature, signature PG, PTG process, which I'm going to have to ask you about later. Throughout her time earning her bachelor's degree in psychology, she focused her studies on eating disorders, body image, self-concept. Uh, mindfulness and personal growth. And while studying, she became highly sought after, uh, highly sought of a coach and speaker in that personal development world and went on to write her number one best selling self help book called Believe Your Way to Badass. She's currently pursuing her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling to bring even greater support, knowledge, and counseling to others that goes beyond surface level to create lasting transformation. And after struggling with depression and anxiety and committing to overcome her unhealthy relationship with food and her body, Celeste made it her mission to help others build more than just a body. You guys, this is the amazing Celeste Rains Turk. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. That was super awesome. Hearing you read it is very different than seeing it typed out on my website too. <laughs> it's yeah, I know it's different, but I mean, you deserve all of that. You've been a busy girl and I love that where it seems like what you're doing, your work and passion comes from your personal story, your personal journal um, journey. And can you tell us, um, you can go as much or a little as in depth, like how did you get onto this path of, um, you said you had some depression. How did you kind of turn around and turn towards healthy body image? How did you learn that? Oh yeah, for sure. That was a uh, quite the process. There was a lot of um, personal awareness that had to be gained, and I'm grateful for bodybuilding for bringing a lot of that awareness to me. Um, but really, you know, back in high school, I struggled a lot with my mental health, and this is common for adolescents for sure. But um, I was struggling, and you know, I had this identity of athlete and. Um, I was really, I considered myself very smart as well and a leader and a team captain and all these different hats that I wore. And I felt like, why is it that with all these amazing things going on in my life that I feel this way? And that was really upsetting for me and I wanted to be even better and better. So I asked myself, you know, what if I had put as much effort off the court from volleyball um, and was able to improve that way? And that actually supported me because I found fitness in that journey. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start eating really well. I'm going to start training really hard outside of the, uh -huh. um, like I said, outside of practice. And this was sparked because I was also in a relationship that didn't go very well, that taught me a lot about myself and what I deserved and what I wanted. And I realized through many periods of my life in this process that I was being treated in ways that I was actually treating myself. I was teaching people how to treat me by how I treated myself. And I wanted to demand more from myself and for myself. So um, by committing to my fitness journey, I was able to start to find some more confidence in my body and also just in life in general, because I was committing to more for me. But unfortunately that opened up a whole other can of worms because what I was dealing with wasn't something that was surface level or could be solved on the surface level. So yeah, I didn't like my body, didn't love my body. I was uncomfortable in my skin. I was sad. I was, I was anxious about being depressed. Mm -hmm. um, I was also a very positive person, so you wouldn't have known it, but that was just another aspect of me that showed. And I remember after, after committing to doing my first bodybuilding show, it revealed to me all the negative behaviors I had when I committed to my finished journey. I abused exercise as a way to change my body. 
I thought that I had to work out after every single thing that I ate. I had a very unhealthy relationship with food. I would binge every weekend. I didn't allow myself to have something like salt. Um, I, I just restricted heavily. I had like a couple of food groups I'd allow. That was it. And, you know, I thought I was living this bodybuilder lifestyle. So I committed to a bodybuilding competition, competed in bikini, had a, a really negative experience. The experience itself, the day up was positive. It was after the fact that was negative. I had a horrible rebound. And that's when it revealed to me, oh, there's a lot more work to do than just showing up at the gym and uh, following a meal plan for some sense of control and confidence. So then I immersed myself into loving myself. I realized I needed to let go of what I thought was necessary and what everyone else had told me and what I had learned from Pinterest or these other coaches I've had or Instagram and instead choose for me what I needed and for my body what I needed. And that's how I found ways to really love myself. What do I need? What's important to me? What do I value? Mm -hmm. So I started going into that. And then I was developing my business as the, at the time as a personal trainer um, and I was studying dietetics and I realized I didn't even want to do that. I didn't want to tell people what to eat because that was a big you know, trigger for me. Yeah. It was more so about the relationship with food. So I worked with different personal development mentors, mindset mentors, business mentors. It unlocked my eyes and my, my world to see there's different theories and philosophies and psychology exists out there self-love is possible. And so after going through that, like you had mentioned in the bio, I decided to commit to earning my degree in psychology. And then that's how I arrived here now to my master's and um, feeling in a much different place with food in my body and my goals than ever. Wow. That is such a journey. And it sounds like you spend a lot of time reflecting and doing inner work and chasing your own demons and getting them out there so that you can come to love yourself. Now, this is really interesting. You mentioned when you're in high school, you were great at everything, school and sports, but you were still not happy. Now, I'm a pediatrician and I practice in real life and in Las Vegas. So when I say real life, like I see real patients and teenagers that come to me and these are like all stars and they are not happy and they often circle really low on their own body image. So I was just curious on your end when you felt like you weren't meeting your own measure. Um, what is it? Was it, was it like your weight? Was it, you felt like you had to be skinnier? Was it that you felt like you weren't pretty enough? What was it that you had to, that was the deficiency that really kind of haunted you? That's a really great question. And I love your uh, willingness to ask and go there. So uh, I would say at the time it was, I was being challenged as an athlete and um, in my education and in my leadership roles in ways that I hadn't been before. Mm -hmm. And so I was facing an opportunity to grow and that was hard for me. It was hard. And I had a lot of times where I felt like maybe I'm not enough. Maybe there, there's a lot of pressure on me. Um, people don't expect me to feel sad. I was, I labeled myself and I accepted labels of the positive, happy, go-getter person who can carry the team on her back or who can support any other friend who goes out of their way for people. Like these were things that I had just uh, taken on as my identity. So then as soon as that was challenged a little, as soon as I felt a little bit off, a little bit sad, a little bit down. I didn't think I was allowed to experience that. So it festered. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when my role in volleyball was maybe challenged, or I had to grow in a new way. That was hard for me because I was used to being very good at it and not mm -hmm. having things taken from me. And I was facing all these, you know, as a teenager, you start to learn there's a real life out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was a hard transition for me. But um, ultimately, you know, it was uh, this feeling of not enough. I I, did, I wouldn't say it was body image related until um, after that negative relationship. I, was, I remember feeling like I had looked in the mirror and I felt very fat. I felt very uncomfortable in my skin. I couldn't be around people at the pool without a towel around. So yes, there was body image there. Did I know what that was at the time? Not exactly. Mm -hmm. I more so just knew I was uncomfortable, didn't like my legs. I was bullied for my size growing up. So there were so many factors to, to take this big question and put it in. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. There's 
many factors. So I was hyper aware of my body from a very young age because I was bullied or because I was warned uh. or taught certain things. But I would say that these things started to manifest when the good aspects of me were challenged mm -hmm. and then it brought up everything. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is so interesting. Sometimes, um, you, because you're such a good leader, you kind of see yourself, you don't really recognize when you need help, like, cause you're always giving to other people. And it's really hard for us to kind of look ourselves and say, Hey, we don't have it all. And we don't know it all. And it's okay to not be okay. Especially in this pandemic right now. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Like it's actually, it's crazy because we tend to think that we can't feel these things or we can't talk about feeling these things. And yet that's exactly what we need to do to move through them. But why would we want to face something hard? We're protecting yeah. ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So you found, skip a few years forward, you started doing bodybuilding. You said that that did bring out some some demons in there because it became a certain way, very, there are certain ways of eating, right? That you have to do. Um, how did you reconcile that? Because well, I guess this is a whole big topic. Sorry, I have big questions. Like how did you start seeing food as um, not your enemy and not a punishment and just something that, just, that nourishes your body? Yeah, that's a big one is I stopped uh, seeing it as punishment and started realizing how important it was. And I allow myself to have what I wanted and to remove the good and bad labels. So I guess from like a tangible effort that someone listening might be able to apply or someone watching, you know, is go through those things that are challenging you with your relationship with food. Is there a restrictive pattern? Is there a tendency to only allow certain things at certain times? Where are those patterns coming from? Be willing to face those recurrences mm -hmm. and find out, okay, how is that contributing to my growth or maybe taking away from my growth? Mm -hmm. And that was really what I had to do is identify how, oh, actually, you know, as much as everyone says following a very strict diet is the only way to achieve a certain result or, oh, even though everyone says you got to it's like no pain, no gain. And like, don't care about anything uh, that can actually result in not caring enough about recovery and running your mm -hmm. health to the ground. And so I started to identify the associations I made between becoming this identity I was after and what other people had said had to be true in order to get there. And I was like, well, what if I did it my way or how would it need to look for me to sustain it? And then what do I need to believe about myself? in order to believe I'm worthy of the nourishing foods, I'm worthy of the commitment to my plan, I'm worthy of the, su the sustaining of the results and the continuation of that process. Wow, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's all about worthy and kind of figuring out what is it that you really deserve to do. Now, since you study psychology, could you enlighten us on what is it when people have these like bad relationships with food, could you say you looked into how you thought of food where did this, um, does it come when they're child, very young, when they're a toddler age? Does it come more like in their school age, certain things, you know, how people, they eat food when they're feeling upset or when they're feeling alone? How, when do we establish those quote unquote, like labels or relationship with food? It can certainly manifest over time and then maybe not present itself until later. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, you know, in our very formative, formative years, so when we're children and we're being taught certain ways of believing and living right versus wrong, good versus bad, um, then we kind of begin to form those associations. You know, kids are super smart, as you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. they'll see mom yeah. doing something and they'll they'll take wow. that as their truth or as, okay, this is what she's doing. Or um, I was just talking to a client the other day. She's like, oh, my, my, my daughter who's 13 is now asking, am I allowed to have this? Can I have this? And she's uh -huh. like, oh no, I'm choosing not to, but she ingrained that in her from a young age. And so that was um, something she came to realize, but no, these things are established and developed over time. And then they're reinforced through behaviors, they're reinforced for things we're, through things we're exposed to, and they're reinforced through our own experiences with them. So there's some people who, you know, I've never had an issue with food. Why are, what is this something that people struggle with? Well, maybe they were never exposed to an environment that would present that opportunity, or maybe the environment they were in, one person could define as an unhealthy relationship with food, but to them it's normal. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of contributing factors, but it does develop over time. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of these things um, become heightened in adolescence. And this is because 
when you're a teenager, you know, a lot of things are revolving around your peer group and the external world. You start detaching yes. from, you know, your parents are your word and your truth and everything, and you can rely on them for everything. You've gone through this child development stage of autonomy and starting to know what that feels like. And then you're a teenager and you're craving that and you want to just have your friends and your own life. And so we start to make these judgments on ourselves based on what we see in our peer groups as normal or on people around us or what's accepted. So that's when things can really get reinforced or learned. You know, if all your friends are dieting and then they're getting positive feedback from the boys you're interested in or the girls you're interested in or whatever, guess what? You're going to want to take on those behavior patterns because you see a positive reinforcement and that, that can and will carry over later if it's not addressed. So to, I guess I, I give you a long winded answer, but um, yeah, it can continue to develop over time. And we see it, especially in adolescence. And then not until we're late adults, like um, a lot of elderly people don't struggle with this <laughs> because mm -hmm. at that point, their stage of development is very different. They're not relying on their peer groups as much for feedback as they are through themselves because they've had a lot of those experiences. Yeah. 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 So gosh, that's true. Absolutely. You're right. I, from my own work, I feel like in adolescence is when some of these really come to play. I mean, there are younger kids, even as young as five that I've seen that have started to have some kind of eating um, disorders. And it's, I always feel like it's really challenging. So, which is why I, I'm so, I respect you so much for the fact that you are targeting that population because they need, definitely need, need like the biggest help there and, and to undo all these associations that we have made. What is something that you tell yourself when, um, that you had to tell yourself to replace some of the negative thoughts that you had about like your relationship with, relationship with food? Mm. Okay, that's good. Good question. So I'll think of a specific example. Um, I had this like ongoing thought that I couldn't have certain foods. So for example, like I was so fearful of having like something off of my plan. And I when I'm in prep mode, I'm in prep mode, like I am 100%. Mm -hmm. But after that, it's like, if I want to have chocolate every day, or let's say an Oreo every day, I'll have it. If I want to have a bite of something off plan, I'll have it. And that was so hard. That was harder for me to allow and to do than just stick to the plan 110%. That's easy for me. That's not the challenge. The challenge was actually allowing myself to do what I really wanted and needed oh, wow. for the sustainability. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So one of the things that I had to do is start like normalizing the foods for myself. And that was one way I did that. And I would tell myself, you know, this is about having one now versus 20 later. Mm -hmm. So by reminding myself of that and okay, I am able to have this every day. Okay. It's not going to make me end up going into a crazy binge session or like I need to have all these other foods. Instead, it's going to free me from these negative thoughts I have about the food itself. That's when I started to really kind of break down those barriers that existed. Um, and I do want to touch on what you said too, about like the five-year-old, mm -hmm. um, how that can present. Like it's interesting because whether you're five or you're 45, Sometimes we use food as a means to an end, as a way of exercising a control, fe feeding an emotion. Brain mm -hmm. is super smart. So children especially, you know, if they can control what they eat, they will, you know, or they don't talk to their parents because it's the one thing they know how to do now and do for themselves so they will <laughs> shut down. Right. Uh, similarly, you know, if you're 45 or you're 30, 20, whatever, and you know that food is a great way that can bring you back to a childhood memory comfort. Mm. Um, or it can secure some feeling of uh, self-responsibility or control, then we tend to exercise it that way. Just wanted to touch on that. Ah, yeah, absolutely. That's why a lot of, um, I don't know if, I, don't, I know you're working with some clients, but in pediatrics, sometimes when um, I refer them out for therapy, I also highly, highly recommend family therapy because it's the dynamic between the parent and the child that is so interesting at play where like the picky eater will eat great at daycare or grandma's, but the minute he comes home, he won't eat anything. So I'm like, ah, I think that might be like, mom has to go to counseling as well. <laughs> I love that you just, I love that you do that. And I love that you brought that up because there's plenty of research that shows that it's like a, ch a child can be getting treated for something mm -hmm. or something can be addressed. As soon as they go back to their family, there may be a relapse. Yeah. And it's, it is important to maybe consider family systems 
theories in mm. treatment and stuff. Now, I'm not a licensed counselor or therapist at the moment, but this is something that I've learned is different theories and approaches to this. And that's absolutely important. Yeah, absolutely. So with bodybuilding, you talked about sus, uh, sustaining because like having, allow yourself having something that's necessarily, not necessarily healthy or quote unquote, like, you know, on your plan is sustainable. Um, can you touch in, touch a little bit about what's the difference for you as you see it when it's in bodybuilding for competition versus like, say somebody who wants to bodybuild, lift weight, going to the gym for, to maintain a good, healthy lifestyle? Mm, I think the difference should be minimal, but it definitely exists. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think when you're prepping for a show, there's so many more factors, you know, you got to pose, you got to make sure you're uh, ready to actually go on stage. So you've got the suit, you've got the look, you've got the presentation. There's so many more factors that are being considered. There's an end goal. There's a date in mind that you got to be ready for, mm -hmm. as you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so versus someone who's just living the lifestyle, there, there should be a little more room for flexibility there because there isn't an end date. Um, this is about sustaining. And I think bodybuilders can learn from the lifestyle people. And I think the opposite is true. Uh -huh. I think um, in bodybuilding, there's so much more of that discipline and that grind and that commitment to the daily effort, because you know, that time's going to run out. Now, mm -hmm. you also can change the end date and make your process even more sustainable or something that you can commit to long term if it's not going your way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it needs to be that big of a difference. Like, if you're, if you're trying to compete, and you're like, but I don't want to give up A, B, C, D, E, F, D. Okay, why do you feel like you need to first and foremost? Mm -hmm. um, and then what would you need to do so that you could maybe keep some of those things from your lifestyle that you really mm -hmm. love and still get on stage without feeling like you need to rush? I think there's mm -hmm. some, some scarcity with that with bodybuilders. And then from a lifestyle perspective, um, not falling trap to what you see, you know, bodybuilders doing and expecting yeah. that from yourself. Like, oh, I'm in, I'm not trying to step on stage, but I'm going to compare myself to a girl who is about to step on stage or has mm -hmm. been for years. That's yeah. not fair. Right. Absolutely. So what do you do? I know you're not, you're still in competition season now, but what do you do in between competition season, like a growth phase? What does that day to day look like to you when you're not competing? Uh, still looks like honoring my goals for the present and the future. And when I say my goals, I mean like physique, mental, emotional, relationship, business, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, in prep, I think sometimes the focus shifts a lot onto prep, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But yeah, I would say the, the major differences are maybe I'll swap something in my meal plan with another food or meal that meets the macros. Um, when I'm in an improvement season, I personally love meal plans. I think they're fantastic. I don't ever want to be, me too. yeah, I love it so much to me. It's just convenient. And I like having the consistency and mixing things up that way. Um, but yeah, in improvement season, I like to give myself the freedom and flexibility to make swaps this past prep. I actually allowed myself to make swaps throughout majority of the prep up until four or five weeks out. I believe this really helped me sustain my results and also, um, continue to come off of autopilot. That's a mm -hmm. big one as well. I don't think we should ever go on autopilot in any season. And then um, also in the improvement season, what looks different, you know, I have a little bit more time and <laughs> not as doing as much cardio, not doing as much time in the gym, you know, you're not posing as frequently. So I like to use that time for other goals and things that are important to me in life. And um, my measurements for success change, like my KPIs, you could say, I'm no longer focusing on necessarily like, oh, am I going to be ready? Am I going to look this part? What do I need to continue to do in the improvement season? It's much more long-term, like yeah. building muscle takes time. So the actual focus and priority shifts from getting to an end goal to just making the next best improvement. And it's a day by day thing in both as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You when you're on prep, especially when you get closer, it, it becomes so time consuming. Like everything you do is just kind of getting through the day. You want your workout, drink your water, get all your macros in, um, all your meals in, and then sleep because <laughs> all that matters. And then the other goals kind of put on the wayside. But I love how you said um, your goal shifts because and there are other goals outside of body image, which is also so important, especially for girls like it's not just how you look, it's what you do with your life, your mind, um, 
how powerful that is, your goals, your finances, those are all like very important goals in that you kind of have to have them all together. You can't really just have one thing totally on the wayside. Like you can't compete without good finances and you can't really step on a stage if you don't have that discipline because everything in at like at work is disorganized, right? So it's important to have that balance. Absolutely. And that will show up in how you present yourself on stage too. Like if you're not actually at peace with yourself, if you're not actually confident in your body, mm-hmm. if you haven't established a feeling of consistency in every area, those things will show up. Like you said, whether that's in your sleep, stress levels, other areas, they're going to play a role and you can't have one without the other. And I actually think that's one of the beauties of bodybuilding is forces us to get those things aligned. Um, and I also think like in the mindset of what your goal is when you have other goals to focus on we become less critical of the one thing and i think that's actually a great yeah. way to distribute our energy absolutely you're right totally now you strike me as someone who's been in school doing different things you're getting your master's degree you wrote a book you have clients and you coach and you work out how do you make time? How do you like organize your day? How do you even do all this? I've been asking myself. Is there a twin? (laughs) I wish. Where is she? I would love to meet her. Well, I mean, I don't know. I would say the number one thing that drives me is the passion and the vision. I have a big vision. I've always led with my heart. And so um, I like to say that I'm purpose-driven and heart-centered because that is how I feel every day. So when I wake up, I'm actually very excited to do what I have to do. Sometimes I'm like, God, there's so much. Like lately, I've been feeling very overwhelmed. But why? Because I'm actually getting everything I've been asking for. So I'm <laughs> having to level up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like overwhelm is a sign of an identity disconnect. So every time I get overwhelmed, I'm like, who do I need to become? What do I need to change? You know, what do I need to believe? And I've been really reinforcing, like every time I find myself kind of complaining, I'm like, okay, well, I've asked for this. This is what I want. And I truly want this. And that feels so much better. But, you know, on a day-to-day aspect, like tangibles, I have a schedule. I have a planner. I write everything down. uh, I schedule things in. I do my best to stick to that schedule. Um, Also recognize things will come up. And I'm willing to uh, have that. I have lists all over the place. (laughs) It's probably a little bit crazy. And like I said, though, it is the vision. So when I'm doing these things, I'm thinking, how does this align with my three core values in my business and my life? Impact, Uh freedom, and love. If it aligns with my three values, we're good to go. Let's commit to it. If it doesn't, okay, well, what needs to change? Or how can I modify this thing that I wanted to do so that it does align? Um, when I align everything with my values, I'm much more motivated to do it. So to me, it's very easy to wake up, do my cardio or do my morning routine or, um, sit down and get back to clients and Mm -hmm. then go to the gym. Like I enjoy everything I do. So it's very, uh, it's very different than I think someone who doesn't enjoy what they're doing. Oh man, I can't. Yeah. I'm sure if you're doing something you don't want to be doing your time, there's nothing that amount of pay or like goodies that can make it worthwhile. When you said three core values, can you say, you say impact? What was the three? Freedom, impact, and love. Phil. Wow. (laughs) Okay. Impact and love. Can you, what is your PTG process? You mentioned a little bit in that in your bio, which can you tell us about that? Yes. So this, um, it, the P stands for peace, T through and G growth. So peace through growth process. Mm -hmm. We always have opportunities to grow, whether that's improvement season prep or lifestyle Uh or in business or any other development phase, but let's specifically focus on like that fitness aspect. So like improvement season or prep, let's say Mm -hmm. it's a growth season regardless. So peace through growth represents actually finding ways to be at peace with the growth that's happening. And as it's happening, whether that's growth in your body, growth through your mindset, because you're challenging yourself to new limits. Maybe that's growth through actually achieving and accepting that you're worthy of the goals. It's all growth. And and, um, I think, you appear to be someone and just from what I've read from all of your captions is, you know, we both believe that there's always an opportunity to learn or grow yes. even through those adversities. And so 
that's really what the PC growth process is about. And it usually starts with discovery and self-awareness, then goes into kind of like an unlearning and like a why, where did this come from? And let's relearn, find new ways to reinforce new behaviors and actions. Mm -hmm. And then it goes into, um, I kind of like to think of it like a garden. So we're essentially like plowing, getting rid of all the, the old soil, laying down new soils, reseeding it, yeah. and then watering and, and then harvesting. So that's really like the general <laughs> view. That's true. Um, yes, I do believe, I absolutely do believe in like everything is growing, even in the times when we don't like the process. Like there will be times when you feel like you're struggling or you don't feel comfortable or even when you're like quote unquote bulking or when you're recovering and doing nothing rest like not we don't always want to do that the mindset of you just keep moving forward like no experience is wasted unless you put your tell yourself that there's no reason for me to get anything out of it but because everything happens and you kind of have that in your whole bag to look back into and just think about later um, yes. it, it gives you a better perspective I was actually talking to a friend yesterday about like the plants growing, like when you repot a plant because say it grew out of its own pot, like me and my boyfriend were repotting our orchid plant that was growing. It had like flower three times, but it was really growing out of its like the original bowl it came out of. So we got a new bigger pot and put it in together. And when we took the roots out from the old one, there were all these like old wilted roots that were already soaked and old and crusty. And we, were, we had to trim it out to cut those off. And so to give it space and room to breathe and get into the new one. And I was like, this is so metaphorical about life. It's like when you grow in and to become, step into a new chapter or step into like a new role or a new, like when you're overwhelmed because you're not used to this whole new image of you, you feel uncomfortable. You're like, does this really fit me? Or what's going on, right? And the new plant, once we, once we planted it, it was like the first two weeks it was looking kind of frail. Because it's just like, I don't know what to do. And you're just kind of worried. But then if you just kind of grow, believe that you're growing, even when you're uncomfortable in this new space, you're going to eventually find your place and mission. And like, you'll start finding like the value and keep going. So, yeah. Exactly. That's beautiful. I love hearing that. That's just <laughs> such a, I, I love the acronyms and I love the metaphors. And I think that's such a strong one that's going to really stick with people. Absolutely. I live in Vegas, so don't, I don't have a chance to have a big green thumb because it's so dry and hot <laughs> here. But the little bit I do at home, like the plants that I keep alive, like every time I do, I just feel like there's so many like ways that we teach ourselves about life. It's the plants, the way like, you know, life grows outside of human lives. It teaches us about growth in general. So yes, true. That's awesome. So what are you working on now? Cause you are doing, you're almost done with your master's program. Is that right? Uh, yes. I mean, it's going by quickly. I'm in my first year anniversary is going to be next month. So I'm excited about that. Um, so yeah, after that, I have like one more year ish of curriculum. You could say actually more like okay. nine months. I took a few extra courses at once. And then after that, I go into the field experience and internship phases. So um, I'm getting there. You know, the ultimate goal is to gain licensure, of course, and mm -hmm. then I would love to run luxury retreats worldwide for people where I combine yeah. the personal development, the psychology, and then group counseling and also individual therapy. So I really want to bridge the gap between like the fitness world and mental health. I think mm -hmm. there's a very unfortunate misconception and judgment from one to the other, you know, it goes both yeah, ways. Uh -huh. I think there's a lot of competitors who are afraid to go and seek mental health support because they're told, well, you have to give that up if you really want peace. Uh -huh. When I don't believe we should have to give up things that contribute to our life in order to have peace. I think we never have to sacrifice our goals to have a healthy relationship with food or our body. And I want to bring that to the mental health space. So that's what encouraged and inspired me. I wasn't even going to do that. It just one day I it had this nagging vision in my head, like literally a visual. And I was like, I have to do it. I have to do it. And so yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> wow. I like how you think, well, what is your biggest, what do you think is one of the, your biggest struggle that you've had, like bridging the two, like the, the fitness world and having the good mental health that you need for it to 
be sustainable? Oh man, I think, I think it's going to be actually changing like anything that has to change is going to be changing the actual thought of what is right versus what is wrong. It's hard to go into somewhere and be like, actually, this is a new way we could be doing it when there are professionals and there are people who have committed so strongly to one theory or one way that they haven't seen, Hey, what about this? So there could be research involved. There could be um, anecdotal support that's necessary to even spark that type of research. There's going to be education that goes beyond textbooks for sure. Um, so I think that's going to be the hard part is like breaking into it. And, you know, I'm going to wiggle my way into like, eating disorder recovery centers and other places, hopefully, and be like, look, this is how I feel about it. And also learn from them and their perspective so that I can, like I said, not, you know, derail the bridge or, you know, tear it down and say, let's separate them forever, but really build the bridge with both parties and see how can we learn and support each other. Yes, absolutely. Because both of these entities are established in a way, right? It's not like you you can't totally rock the boat and maybe they're established that way because for some reason it is there and needs that infrastructure to work. But I do believe that there could be a healthier like marriage between the two and um, where you can be very fit and can have a healthy mindset and when food can be enjoyable. We were talking earlier about how food should be nourishing. And I love using the word nourish, like probably my most hashtag word in my, all my posts. That's awesome. Because like, I don't know about your culture, but my culture and Asians, like everything we get do together as a child is around food. You make dumplings together, you make noodles. Um, and it's so much, not just like the taste of the food is the memory of the food that you have, that you crave. And I think even as people, as we get older, like in the winter, when it's cold or when you're lonely, you want a soup that's comforting. It's like a warm hug. And I just love how you see that as well. Like what is, um, what are you trying to tell your client when clients, when they trying to think of food and they feel like it's like an Oreo is a bad thing. What is, what do you tell them to, to think? Yeah, I think that you just made a very powerful connection. There is culture. And this is what I usually challenge my clients with is like, let's bring a whole new perspective. Let me take you out of the context of like, let's say the bodybuilding or the fitness industry world or the lifestyle, the dieters mentality. And let me ask you this, like, well, what if macros didn't exist? What if measurements didn't exist? What if there were no food scales? What if there was no good or bad label on food? then how would you be making your decisions? And so by taking it out of context, we can read a new context. And so I like to challenge my clients with that in, okay, we're currently looking at food as a means to a physique end goal, rather than a way of supporting your life, your energy, your relationships, the way you're connecting with others or your culture, where you're from. And there's so much more just like, you know, we're building more than just so body, there's also so much more to food than what we're taught to believe about it. We've mm -hmm. been conditioned to see it as a dieting tool mm -hmm. versus a life tool. This is something we need. We can't just mm -hmm. get rid of food. You know, it's always going to be there. We need it to survive and sustain us. So why not make it something that's also very fulfilling and enjoyable? Mm -hmm. um, now, does that mean we always need to give in to that comfort right when we seek it using food? Absolutely not. I also am a big supporter in facing what, why are you feeling there's discomfort? Why are you feeling like you need that? Why is the first thing you think of when you are stressed food? You know, how can we form new associations between other behaviors that doesn't involve eating so that you can achieve those goals? Like I said, Never believe you have to give up your physique goals to maintain, attain mental peace. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is also true. You don't have to give up your mental peace to obtain physique goals. And so I think that that's also important to challenge my clients on is always like, why don't we actually go into this rather than mm -hmm. covering it up with the satisfaction through food, mm -hmm. except that you can do that, but not if it's never addressed. We can't just pretend like there's no underlying issue. I am so excited hearing you talk just the building. So when that's, this is huge, Celeste. So your people are learning and they think that they can only get comfort from food, but it's a condition 
but there's other ways you can feel love and comfort and connection with your family that doesn't involve food and and building new associations when they feel sad they can turn to other things that they can enjoy that fulfill them on the inside that is so exciting and that is it's just mine it's just mind boggling that how much that we are conditioned to think of dieting it's like a thing and it's really interesting like can i say one more thing like i was thinking Please. americans when in america like we have the fast food and all those and it's diet is part of the american culture i feel like so when people say you're going to be go on a diet because you're now you're going to start eating healthy that's a diet but if you go to italy or you go to any a lot of other countries in the world where they do already eat healthy that's their way of eating that's not a diet so we're been told because the american food is the all fast food at the table dinners like winter's party starting to eat healthy it's a diet whereas the world doesn't always think that way right oh yes that is for sure and i love that because that's that's perspective right there mm -hmm. and there's so much intertwined in american culture like individualism there's also this hard work you know hard work wins and you got to work really hard and i think that's wrapped up into it too where i was just talking with a client we were talking about how we often celebrate discipline and we celebrate restriction and we celebrate deprivation and um not that discipline is a bad thing but i mean discipline in the way where it re uh, relates to like sacrifice we tend mm -hmm. to celebrate that more than we actually celebrate like a process that feels good a process that's fulfilling for us a process that we can sustain yeah. and i think that is wrapped up in it and um yeah there's there's so many things to consider in your relationship with food outside of you know just why can't I do this? Why can't I just have one and stop? You know, it's like, okay, let's be a little kinder to yourself because you're, there's so many things that make you who you are. Mm -hmm. Just like there's so many things that make you uh, a mom or a uh, teacher or a, a daughter, whatever other identity you wear, we have to be compassionate with ourselves when it comes to diet and nutrition and lifestyle as well. You're just preaching. You're just preaching <laughs> my world. Yes, that is so true. That is so true. I love it. I have one more big question for you. Actually, two more. But the okay. first one is, what do you tell a, someone who is asking you, well, how do I even find a motivation? I see that you work out. I see that you enjoy having fitness and mind, uh, mindfulness or the mental health. What if I don't even have like the desire or motivation? How do you get that? Mm -hmm. No, that's a big question. Um, well, I always go back to values. I think mm -hmm. that's got to be at the top priority list is identify your values and see how the goals or this ideal you have in your mind that you don't feel motivated by actually aligns with them. Mm -hmm. And then also ask yourself, what am I resisting about that end result or about mm -hmm. that uh, goal that I have, because a lot of times we just have resistance we haven't identified yet, whether that's, oh, well, when I achieve that, that means I actually have to give up A, B, C, D again, you know, oh. what am I afraid and not willing to give up? Or what do I believe I have to give up to get there that then makes me demotivated because I'm not ready to? Or, you know, what parts of your identity do you have to shed that you're not ready to? Or is there a fear around what people will think? That's a lot of you know, common examples for uh, resistance that could come up. So I think identify resistance patterns and then also identify core values. Are you guys getting this? This is huge. <laughs> Are you guys getting this? What am I resisting? What identity do I have to shed? Oh, wow. That's huge. Okay. Love it. Love it. Okay. Letting everybody have that sink in. Last question. And I have to ask you this because you asked every one of your podcast uh, person this. And I always, I wanted to hear your answer. What do you think about before your heels get on the stage? Yes. Oh, man. It's so funny because like I asked that question yet I don't really have like a specific <laughs> ritual myself um, before the stage. I, I do tend to think about like what I've accomplished and um, this past show that I did, I was really focused on like the energy I wanted to bring to the stage and like I got this. So for me, it was like a just like a breath out, letting yeah. it go and getting up there, treating it no different than any other day of posing. Uh -huh. But I don't personally have like something I specifically go over in my head or do. Um, I definitely have running positive thoughts in my head, but I'm not like 
I have to think of this and then I have to put my hands this way and then no, but I'm sure I may establish and develop one over time, but uh, I really just try to get in the energy I want to bring on stage. I love that. So you're just kind of focusing like this is the moment. This is like any other moment that you have been working on. That's great. And you guys, Celeste is very humble. She's not only bikini competitor, she's actually an IFBB pro. No, I'm not. No, you're not? Not not yet. No, I just got nationally qualified and that's the goal in the end. Oh, she's so, you're so This is why I'm so humble (laughs) because I don't have it yet. (laughs) Well, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. You're on you. Exactly. And the right, it's all in the timing, as, as you say in every single podcast. And I'm realizing that yeah. when people get there, it's just like it's meant to be. Exactly. Well, thank you. I am so honored to be sharing the space with you. I'm so excited about your work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Your excitement makes me excited. My cheeks are hurting. Like, <laughs> I've loved this conversation. I know I can sometimes like ramble or go on it's just because I'm so passionate about it there's so many things to cover but I appreciate you giving me this space and asking such amazing questions so that I could share so freely you asked so many good questions on your podcast like I really want to hear from her though so (laughs) I'm excited about your project your next work and I'm everything that's going so thank you so much and you guys Stay and stay tuned with Celeste. You can find her on social media. Can you tell people what's the best way to reach you if they want to follow you or contact you? Yes, for sure. So Instagram is at celestial underscore fit right now. Um, My website's celestial.fit. You can always reach me through there. And I did just release a free food series. It's a food relationship healing and discovery program. That's eight days. It's free, completely free. Um, so if you want to have access to that, I'm happy to give you the link or the info for that. It is in my Instagram bio right now. <laughs> or, awesome. I think it's celestial.fit slash food series now that I'm thinking about it. So you guys can go there too. I think I was looking at it. I was like, this is really cool. This is awesome. Yes. It's like an it's eight day. Fun. Series. Eight days. Yes. That's awesome. You guys. So check it out. And until next time, be fit, be mindful and be happy in every, whatever you do.